that I, I'm particularly excited about this discussion that we're going to be having this afternoon, colleagues. Um, we're delighted that we've got um, Prof. Catherine Burns in the house, who is going to be discussing with us how teaching through humanities lenses contributes to the development of reflective practitioners in health sciences education. And really, if I may say, Catherine, that that um, that that the the fact that uh, you you are presenting for us on the on this uh, professional learning series in um, in what has been aptly termed a, a, dis, a disruption related theme after the good inputs of of Nabila and and others um, more recently is perhaps indicative of the quite exciting bottom up approach that we're taking to introducing this this particular thinking and this particular disruption around the traditional perhaps in what is deemed uh, what is seen as health sciences education in a in a very sort of narrow what is traditionally quite a narrow and 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 quite biomedical focus um yes top down approaches can work but um is it not more transformational and more collaborative if we take a bottom up approach and and can i just say catherine um that that before you start that it's really a, has been an absolute delight um to have you as part of our our collective teams if i may put it that way in terms of your links to the and i know shira joins me in this sentiment in terms of this the chse the dfmpc the adler the office of teaching and learning under Prof professor mguni and we're delighted to have you on board with us over these recent months and 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 may it continue long into a very productive future in the world of in the in the theme and 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 discipline and growth of of uh, medical and health humanities so over to you all the thank you oh what a lovely welcome and that's how i felt working with yourself with the team in your uh, fantastic department with shira and the wonderful people on this corridor and with my colleagues at adler and also bumped into a whole group of students as i came into the building a few hours ago from the adler who were all bubbling over with enthusiasm about their placements. These are the HSS uh, three uh, students and also some clinical associates. So it's really been the most tremendous, uh, nearly just over two years that I've spent with you all. A great privilege. Thank you so much. And so it is with humbleness, but also excitement that I present some of these ideas to you. Um, my original version of this presentation included a lot of photographs uh, some of them rather badly taken by myself with my cell phone camera in Glasgow, in Strathclyde, in Edinburgh, in Durham, in London, in Leeds, in Bergen, in Oslo. But I took those sort of family snaps out. I'm happy to share them with you another time because I, it would take too long. And really, in a sense, what it was doing is it was me showing over and over in my fantastic opportunity that I had to travel through some of those places in Europe in uh, June, that the proof of concept that we're developing here at WITS is globally legible. And that colleagues in what many people call the global north, including the very far north, as in Oslo, they're not really doing things a lot better than we are, even though they often have more resources, at least financial ones. In fact, they're very excited to hear about what we are doing and at these esteemed and sometimes quite ancient uh, schools of medicine and of health sciences, such as in Edinburgh um, or in Cambridge, where I went, um, they're actually also trying right now to draw the medical humanities more profoundly back into their health degrees. And they say back because as many of our colleagues have shared with me in the north, uh, medicine and the arts, which include philosophy, history, uh, approaches to pedagogy, the plastic arts, which includes painting and sculpture, uh, the, the, the rise of the social sciences, such as anthropology and sociology, and definitely literature, theology, classics and languages. They have been in a long conversation with science with medical science, with medical expertise. And it took a very big rupture in the period between the 1920s and the 1960s, starting in the United States and then following through some countries in the Northwest and then reaching as far as Japan before the reverberations began the other way again in divorcing uh, the sciences from the humanities. 
And I think it's this long conversation of bringing some of the mutually intertwined parts of that project back together that we're involved with here. Some of you are familiar with what the Adler Museum of Medicine looks like now. And this is a space that is dynamic and undergoing change. The top right hand photograph is uh, the beginning of an experiment that we have been conducting with colleagues for about a year and a half now, where we literally transform the space of the museum, where there would normally be chairs set up for talks or there'd be a kind of silence as people walk around a, a rather traditional museum. And in some ways, a museum that looks more like a museum from the 60s than it does from the 21st century. We've been turning it into a working space. And these are the, some of the people that have been involved, and I'm not even including all of the names. And we have an idea of the Adler as part of this disruptive set of activities and curriculum productions and research that are seeding different programs in the faculty that takes us from its history um, inside of a person's flat in Hilbra through to a slightly grander house in Kilani, and finally into the Bramfontein Medical School complex, and then finally moved up here to the uh, Health Sciences campus in the 80s. And we want to show that journey of the history of medicine and the history of healing and the history of biomedical science at WITS in what we do, but we also want to show the bigger solar sphere around it. And so we're thinking about the Adler Museum as a treasure house, that it could be seen as the heart of the Faculty of Health Sciences, and that it could lead specifically into building undergraduate and graduate curriculum, and that we could offer the knowledge that we have and the technologies we're developing, and we work constantly with interns and with highly skilled colleagues such as Nabila and Shira and others. And we can draw this into a range of different places on our campus and that we can actually invite all of you to to ask us to join with you in your work. And so I hope that Nabila doesn't mind putting up in the chat now a small poll that we're asking you to fill in while I carry on with the rest of some of our slides. And you'll, the sense of the poll, I hope, will emerge by the end of this presentation. So we are involved in a place that seems to be creaking with the past, rare books, biographical collections, ancient publications. Well, they're not that ancient. Many of them are between 60 and 100 years old. But the oldest texts that we have in the, at the library are 4,000 years old. And then we come right up to materials that were technologies, that were productions, that included photographs and other learning materials, including these old carousel slides and the very, very first x-rays that were undertaken in Johannesburg, all the way up through heart-lung machines, through breathing machines, and through the early technology of CAT scanning, and so on and so forth, through the middle of the last century. Wits, as many of you know, was a pioneer in many of these fields and also in surgical fields that involve transplant. And so inside of Adler, we have this storehouse of material, but it lies dormant most of the time. And yet it can be an inspiration and a springboard, quite a radical one, into challenging, transforming and creating object-led and material-based resources for learning and education. Of course, this includes things such as documentary films and art materials, but it also includes ways of, of, of observing and slowing down and looking at objects, both physical and real that can be held, and also ones that can be digitized that can really cause productive new thinking in our different health science spaces. We have, of course, already begun to develop and draw these into uh, medical humanities content. And this is really given a huge array of space in the online BCNP third year course and in the health uh, system science courses in first year, second year and third year. And they will also begin to flower in our major that we're offering in medical humanities as an option next year and our medical and health humanities uh, stream inside of the honors in HSS. We have a digitization program where we're taking a very important set of texts, one called the Leech and one called the Adler Bulletin. And we're digitizing a, a huge chunk of material from the 20th century. 
they focused originally on the writings and the thoughts of doctors and of doctors in training at WITS. But even by the first decades of their existence, they included interpolations and thoughts from what we would now call biomedical engineering, from fields such as the therapeutic sciences, from philosophers, from artists, from ethicists, from political thinkers. And they include a vast array of materials that uh, are sometimes the first publications of some of the most significant medical professionals, political theorists in the country. Mary Matlatlela, Mary Gordon, Sidney Brenner, Joseph Gilman, Albert Plumer, Raymond Dart, Eustace Kluver, Sidney Kark, Joe Verriara, Philip Tobias, and many other people published their first pieces in these documents. And we have specific aims in digitizing these collections, not only preservation for the importance of heritage, but because the correspondence around these articles and the reason that they were published in their day are very rich resources for our considerations in our work now. And we've also looked at obtaining funding to continue to make this work available and not only for history of epidemics courses which we are seeding many of our undergraduate materials with or histories of health and healing systems but also other themes that we're tackling cancer research kidney work the birth to 20 survey and related work infant and pediatric health in our city women in medicine hospital and clinic histories and then medical pioneers themselves the growth of chemists and pharmacists, the black pioneers that affiliated with Wits University, often with a hostile reception, archives about nurses and nurse training and oral histories, the rise of occupational and physiotherapy, mental health and the complex history of psychiatry, traditional healers, particularly in Karting, from Mama Lodi literally to Soweto, the history of the Mai Mai market in central Johannesburg and its relationship to chemists and pharmacists and many more sub themes. And one of the ways that we're doing this, given that we've got a very small staff devoted to this at the moment, and we're, and we're borrowing energy and creativity from colleagues who are also fully occupied in other forms of work, is that we're drawing on uh, graduate students and people doing PhDs and masters to help us to develop research-led exhibitions. And to this end, we've invited a wide array of people from the campus across Janssmas Avenue, our own humanities faculty, but also people from the University of Johannesburg and the University of Pretoria to uh, allow us to help create digitized and in-person exhibitions with topics as various as plastic surgery, childhood disease, audiology, and so on and so forth. And some of the material objects that are driving our work, you can see in these pages. And these are some of the people that have been involved coming in and creating these uh, these exhibition materials. I'm just going to see if I can play this. I hope you can hear this. And if you can't, um, I might speed some of this up. These are some of the exhibitions that we have been actually hosting with workshop materials, with people discussing boxes, looking at objects that we have found in the back archives, beginning to develop themes from their master's research, going back and forward between the backstairs spaces of the Adler and the forward spaces of the Adler. Just move ahead to a section that um to take um objects out we need to have gloves here some of you will see patent medicines that you recognize there so um as well you know a little bit faster <laughs> that's one thing yeah <laughs> All in all, we've had eight of these uh, days so far with um, workshops where we draw in people with specializations in such things as museum practice and object practice. And we are making a record of how we're doing this. And what we hope to do over the course of the next year is to draw in colleagues from a variety of schools in our faculty and lead them through similar projects. 
context. So that we can contextualize these objects and think and through this is for all the what they speak to you know, in our research and in our work. So we're wanting these materials. Some of them are photographic, some of them are object based, some of them are technology such as machines, uh, and much of them are also uh, materials in the form of letters, in the form of diaries, we, in the form of record books and case books. We want to find ways to bring them alive in the space of the faculty. And one of our first experiments in doing this in a grand new way will be on the 7th of September when Professor Linda Lanium Guni and Professor Cook and many of our other colleagues in the faculty will convene. And we hope that all of you can join us between 2 uh, p.m. and 4 p.m. when the On Breathing exhibition will be launched and when we'll have a round table discussion, we'll be sparking ideas about how to bring alive the medical and health humanities. Exploring the relationship between mining medicine and Johannesburg's relationship to breathing, lung and chest illnesses. And of course, the month of September closes with the um, Botlale Orenstein lecture that this faculty supports every year and has done so for nearly 65 years. And that's where the link to not only the history of silicosis and of tuberculosis will be explored, but also perhaps more esoteric issues about the rhythm and the breath of the city and about the way in which the inhabitants of Johannesburg, many of them from far distances, as far north as Malawi, who have migrated here over many thousands of kilometers and have contributed to the life of the city, as well as the clinical science and the uh, medical research that produced uh, ameliorating uh, treatments for the very, very harsh conditions of underground mining. And then also a reflection on the environmental crisis that that caused and the knowledge about, for example, uh, vaccinology that, that South African scientists were able to step up with. And of course, we know about this, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also wanted to tell you all, as we did in the Teaching and Learning Day, that we've started a whole range of oral history projects because we've realized that in both urban and rural health settings, WITS health scientists and uh, WITS students involved in nursing training and in medical education have been absolutely crucial to the development of knowledge that has spread all across the globe about how to treat and how to work with communities and the people of South Africa in best practice, community-oriented primary health care. And th this is an example of a multi-generational workshop where the oldest person in the room is in their 90s and the youngest person in the room is in their 50s that we've been engaged with so that these memories are not completely lost and so that we can build this into master's research and PhD research and enliven and deepen in a fundamental way our understanding of the kind of context out of which this university has emerged. And you might ask, where does this object and textual and artistic material fit into a health science faculty? And this is some of the ways that colleagues of ours in places like Cambridge and Vanderbilt University and some of the universities in Malawi like Chancellor's College, universities in India like New Delhi University of Medicine, this is how they are drawing the arts and humanities into their fundamental foundations for health science education. And they are bringing the arts and humanities back into a conversation with science, where technical judgment and clinical judgment and scientific acumen is seen as an interpretive skill, which needs to draw on educatability, personal development, broad perspectives, humane judgments, contextual knowledge um, and the insights from arts and humanities to take us forward. And these are some of the people that that are actually bringing their knowledge to the table for us. And these are some of the new people that are convening under the CHSE and under the Department of Family Medicine and Primary Care. And we'd like to see many more examples of this. I think I'll end there and ask if I can uh, press the escape button if we can ask Nabila to uh, send us a little message in the side space, you can stop sharing so that everybody can um, join in with this part of the session. 
We're at 16.25. And if I open up my chat, I see a hope. Yes, thank you, Nabila. She's just put that document up for all of us. Now, I don't know how many of you in the small survey that we ran just now have ever used an object or text at the core of a pedagogical encounter, whether you are working in a laboratory setting or in anatomy lab, or whether you are running a lecture for 250, I don't know, fifth year medical students, or whether you're working with a group of uh, professional nurses or pharmacists, or you're working on a particular theme, what we are really intrigued to discover is to what extent any of you have thought about a text, an artifact, or an object that you've used in clinical teaching. And what we'd really love you to do is to fill in and populate this uh, um, little table that Nabila's put up. Now, obviously, you can remain completely anonymous, but what we're actually hoping to do here today is to see if what I've presented to you stimulates your thinking. And if you think of your own discipline or area of specialization and interest, of course, many of you are from family medicine, but not all. You've got people in the room who've got a very strong background in nursing or in therapeutic science, or people that have gone all the way through the MBBCH and might be doing their PhD now in health education. If you can think about a particular way in which you could use an image, an object, object or a text, such as a letter or a diary, or an original document or a newspaper, and if you could put that into the, um, the table, and if you're prepared to put your name, even better, then we will collect this and we'll use it as a form of stimulation to actually come back to you and reach out to you. And while I give you a few minutes to do that, you can see, I hope, the way in which Nabila and myself and Nabila's colleagues and my colleagues have been thinking about how the simulation lab, which is about the present and the future, and about dramaturgy and bringing to life complex and difficult discussions and interactions that are technical. How do you do a lumbar punch? How do you do a, a pap smear? How do you draw blood? How do you make patients feel comfortable in a complex interaction, especially children? All the sorts of things that Nabila was talking about last week, but also more esoteric issues. Um, can we use the simulation laboratory to have complex discussions that involve uh, sexual identity, that involve race and hierarchy, that deal with complex interactions across cultural and other forms of power hi hierarchies across language groups. In the same way, we think of a place uh, like the Adler, uh, which is part of this hub of creative projects and of workshop projects. We think of that as being a learning space. Yes, it draws on the past, the far distant past, the recent past and the present. And in a sense, it's an analog to Nabila's space. And we would like to create a kind of bridge, or if you want to think with the language of maternal health, an umbilical cord between these different parts of the body of medical knowledge and of health science knowledge. And Nabila and myself have sparked ideas over the last few months about how we could do this. Um, and I'm just looking at C, seeing the community oriented primary healthcare project documents written by Sydney and Emily Clark, the court judgments on the behavior of the Steve Biko doctors, um, the evolution of the stethoscope. If I just take the first one, on the court judgments um, on the behavior of the Steve B uh, Biko doctors. One of the most interesting things that the Adler has is a series of beautiful paintings that are extremely emotionally rich that Colin Richards did when he was a young technical artist working for the um, pathologist, uh, Dr. Gluckman, who was the pathologist that the Stephen Bantu Biko family requested do an autopsy on Stephen Bantu Biko's body after the South African police services were required through an interdict that a judge heard from uh, now Sir Sidney Kentridge, who was acting as, a, as an advocate on behalf of the Biko family, um, uh, caused to be in the judge's hands. And the judge said, you now have to hand over the corpse of this deceased person for another post-mortem. And a very famous South African pathologist did that. 
and he asked for the best technical drawer in Johannesburg to be present, both because photography at the time, as I understand it, was not well developed enough to give a full depiction of the wounds on that man's body, but also because in the view of Sir Sidney Kentridge, certain kinds of line drawings would be able to be more anatomically useful in what he predicted would be a future court case. And um, this had such a profound impact on the recently deceased uh, Professor Colin Richards, who became a professor of art at Wits later and then at Michaelis in Cape Town, and who passed away, I think, about seven or eight years ago. This experience of drawing the, the, the corpse of Stephen Biko, that it haunted his entire visual imaginary. That over the course of his career, he produced several works of art which hang in the National Gallery in Cape Town and also in the Johannesburg Art Gallery collection now moved to the Anglo buildings and also in the Adler's possession. He responded to that experience in his life and he developed a whole methodology as an art practitioner around that. And so not only do we have the anatomical drawings we also have the archives of the pathologist involved. We also have the responses from doctors who were advocates and who uh, galvanized themselves to be part of an, um, a, a criminal uh, investigation of the doctor's conduct that were involved in signing off uh, Stephen Biko's death. And that eventually, as you know, resulted in a major court case and the striking off, even though temporarily, of both of those doctors. And it also resulted in the formation of a, of a parallel health professionals entity in South Africa called NAMDA. And that in turn resulted in a whole series of ethical decisions that doctors around the country were called to account about. And so this particular theme of the court judgment on the behavior of the doctors has not only the court documents that Adler holds, but documents from the lawyers involved, the Witz doctors involved, the Witz legal officers, Witz trained uh, professionals in the field of law, the legal resources center at Witz, um, the expert advice of um, uh, Sir Sidney Kentridge, and then the artistic production that reverberated outwards from this, including a play that was produced uh, by Fatima Dokrat that used the actual text of the uh, hearings at the South African Medical and Dental Council about it. Now think of that profound sea of, of textual and object materials that could be drawn into a very profound form of interaction around the, the knowledge that was generated by that um, extremely painful experience in South African history. And that's just one example that I can give you. Um, the evolution of the pap smear speculum. We have an entire cabinet of obstetric instruments, uh, instruments and of gynecological instruments at the Adler. And um, we also have photographs of doctors using them in the 1920s and 30s at Wits. And we also have the collected materials from midwives and from nurses in training about the complex hierarchies around the use of the speculum. And we have oral accounts by uh, women at places like the Queen Victoria uh, Maternity Hospital and the Bridgman Maternity Hospital about how difficult it was to learn how to use these instruments and how hierarchical the form of educational instruction was around who was allowed to use a speculum and who was allowed to conduct a genital exam and how this was taught and what the kind of performative aspect of this should be uh, in the in the first 80 years of its existence. So that's another really rich area that could be explored, the whole complex field of genital health, of reproductive health, and of the technologies, and also the instruments used, but also questions of touch, questions of affect, of interest, and of emotion that come into those complex encounters. So I think I'll stop talking because we now have uh, 25 minutes and open it up for discussion and for people to ask questions and I welcome people such as Nabila and others to help me respond to questions from the floor.
trying to see if people are raising their hands. In order to see what people are writing in the image object text section, I'm not able to see if people are asking questions in the chat. Let me switch to the chat. see any hands open. Yeah, Catherine, I think we're dead. No hands at the moment. OK, um, but allow me to 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 jump into the silence, if I may, and take advantage. Um, first of all, thank you very much for for um, a very interesting presentation. W what is your reflection on the on the actual pedagogy that or, or pedagogies that that might might work for us? How, how do we how do we actually because we can't bring we can't bring um, 350 GEMP 3 students, for example, into the into the Adler or maybe we can in, in small groups, of course. <laughs> but you, you, just some reflections on that, if you if you wouldn't yeah. mind. This, I think, links very well to Nabila last week and to many of the things that um, Shira and her team are proposing and putting to the faculty. And from what I understand from listening closely, that Carol Hartman has also been working on. Um, we have learned so much during the pandemic, and so much that we've learned has been horizontal learning. We've learned new technologies. We've learned how to create blended learning platforms. We've worked with instructional designers. So in some of the course material that I skipped over quickly, what we've been able to do as, as teams is to place uh, visual materials, mini videos, um, beautiful three-dimensional objects that can be turned, um, um, scanned and digitized very beautifully in highly pixelated documents, and place them into, for example, a section on uh, the history of South Africa's Public Health Acts and all of the legal paraphernalia under which um, the performance of medicine and the um, the guiding instruments for medical practice in this country take place, which includes nursing and allied disciplines and uh, medicine itself. Instead of just giving people textbook materials, okay, you need to know all of these key health acts, you need to know the transformation after 1996, uh, you need to know what these particular governing pieces of medical legal legislation are and that will help you in your ethics section and that will help you in your practice and um, it will also help you understand the kinds of responsibilities that you have which come under in an ancient sense the Hippocratic Oath. Fine. Well we've been able because of the methodologies of online and blended learning to give people a much more finely grained sense of how these acts came to be and what's the purpose of that? That allows people to see that medical legal um, frameworks don't just come dumped onto a society in one big galump. They grow layer upon layer. They are interpolated like the leaves of or the layers of an onion. And each uh, previous error uh, sticks onto the next one. This is important for people to actually almost have an experiential learning of so that they don't have a flat view of how um, the context and policies that we are within at any one time have to remain so. They can see the weaknesses of them. They can see the way in which strengths emerge in a de jure sense or legal sense that in no way match the de facto or the real world ability to deliver them. They see the dialogical form of that, which is pedagogically rich instead of learning things off by heart flat. And in order to do that, they have to engage with it critically. They have to see, okay, to what extent did epidemics, particularly the 1918-1919 Spanish flu, how did that shape the mm. kind of uh, curative um, language and sanitation syndrome obsession of the original health acts? How did South Africa's already very divided, segregated form of uh, political organization map onto that? And how did that over time 
uh, amplify divisions that formed ultimately these different systems, such as the Banchistan system of health, separated off from the city urban system okay. dominated yeah. by white health. Now, if students have uh, a series of lectures and experiences online that bring these materials online to life, and then they have a tutorial where in a group of 15 or 25, they go into the Adler to set up tables where they actually literally with their own hands with gloves on, flip through a whole series of these acts. Also see the annotations, the pencil comments written from 1919, 1944, 1948, 1956, 1968, 1973, 1996, and then more recent amendments. And their photographs of the people involved. And there are little audio clips of the people who have been interviewed more recently about, let's say, the last 30 years. And then they discuss with each other about what they see as the strengths and weaknesses of Section 27 of the Constitution now or of the current Health Act. They leave that 45 minute or 50 minute tutorial with a profound learning about what, how complex medico legal texts are. And they don't walk out the room with, with just a few simple facts they learned from a textbook. They've had a profound, deep and meaningful mm. experience, which hopefully they then take into their life as a health systems person, as a nurse or as a doctor. So that's one example, Richard, that we actually Catherine, been thank doing. you. Thank you. I'm going to come before I come to Daniela, I see in the in the chat. Um, Catherine, if, if we, when, once you've um, responded, I'm also seeing that um, amongst the the uh, the fairly um, narrow minded um, biomedical medically focused Richard Cooks in the audience. Um, we've also got um, Matthew McClure and uh, who's joined us. And I wonder if you might take 10 seconds to just introduce Matthew to the to the to the team, to the gang. And um, and just for us to understand a little, perhaps Matthew could tell us his his uh, PhD topic or just say hello to, to the to the group. Let's do that now, actually, if we may. Matthew, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Hello, everyone. And and your 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 role, if I may, because you're now linked to the Adler Museum, in in, in a under under Catherine's guidance. Um, but tell us a little bit. Just tell us a little bit about what you're involved in and and your PhD, if you would, sir. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I come from a, a initially a fine arts background at the Bits School of Arts, uh, and then segued into a master's in history of art. Um, with a focus on museology and uh, exhibition making and object research. So uh, I met up with Catherine and Stephen Pence a year or so ago. I've been based at the Adler for a year, um, really sort of trying to play a part in revising the sort of exhibition strategies within the museum, but then also trying to sort of develop teachable content in the form of, of the sort of graduate-led exhibitions that Catherine referred to. Um, and then the exhibition that we are doing for the Adler, for the Bit Centennial uh, linked to the Butlali Orenstein lecture with Nina Barnett on breathing. So, you know, sort of using materials and objects within the museum to open up discussions, open up debates, and as part of that, create teachable content that we can use online for health system science and medical and health humanities students. Uh, and then my PhD has sort of developed out of that in a very organic way, uh, linked to Dr. Tim Wilson's um, bequest of archives and documents related to his time at the Alexandra Health Center, as Catherine also already, uh, already outlined. So that's kind of been my involvement so far. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that gives a quick overview. Excellent. No, thank you very much. And very nice to have you on board and and um, very interesting for colleagues on the call on the on uh, to to understand a little bit about what what another team member within the Adler is involved in. So thanks very much, Matthew. Okay. To Daniela, let's let's hear from you. You you have your hand up. So thank you so much, Catherine. This was fantastic. Um, I've always been wondering um, as to what more could we do in our in our teaching um, to make sure that it's as universal as, as possible. And when you started talking, it reminded me of um, when I when I went on to join a, a substance use program. In actual fact, in the deduction period, so after all the theory, 
we ended off by going to the Hillbrow Theatre to watch a play called, um, I think it was Umlembu, Umle something of the sort. And it, it was around addressing this whole pathologi path, path, pathologizing, that's the correct word, of, of Nyaupe. Because I think what the trainers realized is a lot of us, I mean, the theory we were sold, but there was just that internal conflict that obviously people were bringing um, and that perhaps it's easy to just give everybody the science, the neurobiology of it, um, but the use of community theater um, as a way to give that sort of that finality of, of this entire training around addiction care. I think it was more profound, I think, than the four days we sort of spent on campus um, doing the neurobiology of, of addiction. Um, and so I'm, I'm keen to find out, you know, are, are we looking at possible um, aspects of even play theater and fine arts? I mean, I remember in high school, um, I remember you used to have, maybe you, you're learning a particular topic and then maybe you go to the museum or you go to a play at the end of, um, of that particular um, coursework that you, that you did. And that just helps brings everything together. And for people who think in a different way or like learn in a different way, um, having this other medium using the arts actually just helps within the, the learning space and, and, and how people absorb knowledge and how they engage with, with the content. Richard, can I um, pick up please, the, Catherine, the baton please. from Daniela? Thank you so much for that, Daniela. And again, I'm sure that your thoughts are resonating with Nabila's presentation last week um, around drawing in drama and art students to, um, to help us actually embody uh, uh, experiences of revulsion and of externalizing and of othering and of enacting so that empathy, but also critical uh, thinking level um, uh, possibilities get uh, heightened. So one example, we do have a group of people in our UJ group, University of Johannesburg group, who are studying the history of um, addiction in Southern Africa going back several hundred years and up to the present, which particular forms of addiction get criminalized and which don't, and how race and class and gender get attached to and also make addiction so complex to address. Well, one of the things we discovered at Adler last year is that in the archives of the uh, manuscript collection, there are several very interesting essays written by Dr. Mordecai Gomede, one of the early Black Wits graduates, one of very few in the 1940s, who went on to an illustrious career, including becoming a district surgeon in the north of Durban, an area called Verulam Stanger, which was a very interesting concession by white political authorities because it was largely an Indian African area. Actually also included Grautville where, um, where uh, Dr. Um, Latuli lived, the Nobel Peace Prize winner and who was at that time Secretary General of the ANC. And Dr. Mordecai Gomede wrote a text about alcohol and addiction and linked it to the sugarcane industry and to mining. And he also looked at the way that addiction um, uh, and, and gender work together, particularly men, away from their families for long periods of time. And it's a, it's, a, it's a series of essays that are both about addressing stigma and addiction, but also calling out hypocrisy of the alcohol manufacturers and of, in those days, the rather small company, SA Breweries, which actually grew out of the mining industry and the provision of alcohol to miners. And he also looked at the efforts to create a tot system amongst the sugarcane workers, which largely failed in KZN, but in the Cape, giving people the dop or, or pieces of, or, or um, cups of, of very um, sugary, highly alcoholic, uh, sort of end of the wine season drinks to the grape pickers became instantiated and part of their wages. And so if you can imagine that if you used textual material from the Adler, photographic collections, um, the, the material also of some psychiatrists and a guy called uh, Professor Jaime Maras and another man called Professor Seftel, um, their, their records at the Adler speak volumes about the different efforts that people made over the 20th century to address this issue. 
Now, they didn't have all the answers in each generation, but being able to draw these forward and being able to engage students at all levels of uh, health and medical education on the question of addiction and then having an experiential trip such as the one you suggest to a drama production on something like that, watching a film uh, and then maybe going into the simulation lab where somebody such as Nabila would work very carefully with an addiction expert to set up a scenario. That would be an extremely profound engagement around medical education, including, of course, clinical pharmacology, uh, psychosocial aspects and so on. So I hope that gives you an example of the way in which your question could be actioned in an intervention like this. Catherine, thank you. To, sh to, uh, to Shira, I see your hand. Welcome. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, Kath, it's tremendously exciting. I don't know if you know that that my specific area um, of interest when I, when I was teaching in the main building um, is uh, psychopharmacology. So, so what you've outlined there is a particularly interesting approach to teaching not only just content, but um, um, the axiological side, the idea that there are values and social mores that that people were involved with, and then how we could judge those against what we know today, but also against where we hold ourselves today. So that's really exciting. What I wanted to take you forward with, though, is the idea that what you're speaking about here a lot is content related. So you're talking about how the history intercalates with our current knowledge, but there's a lot of archival material. There's actual content that you'd want people to be involved with. And that's what makes the pedagogy so exciting and ways that you can um, mix it up, say, uh, in terms of using different modalities to teach. My huge concern here, though, is the kind of skill that the student is learning. Because we know, uh, as we know, that students write exams and exams are important when their scores are important and a lot of their learning is driven through something that they have to be scored on. And I was thinking that this medical humanities idea is a space where we can develop a whole lot of skills that they're not developing um, in their current programs. For example, reading with meaning, for example, reflective practice that's more than just what happened and how would you change it. For example, writing skills. Uh, which our students are particularly deficient in. So all of those things are things that we could tie into the program, looking rather not at the pedagogy, but at the assessment aspect. And and I'm thinking that I would love to hear your views on, on different kinds of assessments where you feel we could be, or what kind of skills you think we could be building using the vehicle of a medical humanities program that students would take seriously and that would actually develop them as human beings, um, not just as medical practitioners. <laughs> and I think there's a difference there. <laughs> this is so interesting, and I'm seeing stuff in the chat now, and I'm also aware that um, Nabila put up something. There are three, three quick things that come to mind, knowing that our time is also coming to a close, but provocations that, that come from what you've said. The one is how blown away we were uh, in 2020, 2021, and I'm sure it's happening again in 2022, I'll know soon. We were by uh, students grappling with a long form written assignment where they were presented with primary documents, uh, secondary analyses of these, and then literally raw data and asked to pull together sheets about numbers of infections, numbers of people dying in a particular pandemic. We chose the flu pandemic and then later the polio pandemic. And then texts that were written at the day, literally eyewitness accounts as human beings were beginning to understand that there was an epidemic or pandemic unfolding. And then reflections written by scholars later, including clinical uh, historians, or people who'd been uh, highly skilled professionals through a pandemic. And then they were asked a, a kind of almost forensic detective like question. Looking at these documents, how can you ascertain this? And what is your opinion of that? And how would you conclude with that knowledge? And we wondered how students would be able to tackle that especially people who'd never done any history before and had really done the sort of literary subjects at school in, in a rather glancing way. 
and Stephen and myself and Kat and others built a very uh, complex set of layered instantiation so that they could build to that, starting with a paragraph, with complex sentences, figuring out what their sources were, extracting material. So we got the most rich papers, seven to, to 10 pages in length. They could be published in something like the Daily Maverick. Nobody failed the exercise and they were able to get feedback all the way along the way. And there is, and we also got an external reader from the history department, um, whose PhD is from Oxford University, in the in using medical history, Annie Devonish, to look at some of them to check that we weren't grading people too highly. And she was benchmarking it against third year students on that campus. They were outstanding, and the students chose to put them in their portfolio of continuous learning, so they got a grade or an assessment for it. But many of them, I think about 70% of them, have actually decided that they were so proud of them, they want to have them there in their kind of portfolio of what they've produced. Um, that's one answer. Another sort of way of, of coming at your point is that the skills that they know they're going to need as they go out there into the world um, and, and practice various forms of health knowledge and health skill is advocacy. One of the most striking things that comes out of this archive, that surfaces out of it, is the importance of being able to name and articulate problems in structure, problems in technology, problems in ethics, problems in uh, human interaction that lie at the heart of so much of the dis-ease that our students are needing to get a handle on as they go out as medical and health professionals. And learning the skills of uh, analyzing complex scenarios and writing forms of advocacy into it, whether it's letters that explain a scenario, letters to the press, letters to a professional body, drawing on other people through social media and new forms of communication to address an issue. Students can see the ways in which people have done this over time and how they've been effective in doing that. And that's another very important skill. I can see Richard's coming back. I'm answering in too long a form. There are at least two other ways, uh, Shira, that I would think of it, but I'll, I'll hold that for now. Yeah. Oh, now Richard's. I'm, no, I'm back. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it to look like I was I no. was rushing you, Catherine. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so Shira, I, I agree. And maybe I can add, add one more thing on that isn't please. as textually related. Um, one of the things that we found is really, really interesting to put as a problematic into the room is to tackle an issue that's really hard to tackle in lecture format. Um, and yet it is something that students could be assessed on and it has, has content in it. And that are some of the, the really big debates of our day. They include particularly topics around reproductive and sexual health, issues of race and equity and justice and complex interprofessional um, journeys. So one of the most powerful forms of feedback that we've had from Nabila and Aviwe and others in the clinical associate degree is, is actually unpacking what a mid-level health professional is, linking towards nursing and towards uh, being a doctor or medicine, and trying to understand how that evolved in South African history and in other parts of the world as part of building resilience and a professional identity, as a part of finding voice. And, and that can be done in a really context-rich way, but also allowing a debate to emerge where people see the, the complex um, formation behind their own professional uh, uh, BSc. And that has been really interesting to watch. Another one has been around Depa Provera, the debate around contraceptive access in South Africa, the, the female directed nature of um, fertility uh, control, the layers of power, the history of South Africa's own family planning programs, and the complex human rights and intergender debates that happen around that. So a huge amount of reading students have done in their debate groups. They've uh, really worked, I think, much harder than many people would do if they were just given a textbook and had to write a short paragraph on it or answer multiple choice. And they also have affiliated to arguments which weren't of their choosing, but they needed to make that point. And we've done them in actual live debate sessions. 
and they are very happy to be assessed about it because they feel they've put a lot of work into it. They're very proud of the points that they were able to draw from the literature and they all feel competent, they say, to write at least a paragraph or even longer in an exam and also to engage in patient doctor, patient nurse, clinical practitioner, patient discussions with a language and with a vocabulary that they wouldn't have had if they had just read a textbook piece. So those are just some examples, all of which are have been and can be um, accessible outcomes from these sort of encounters. Such an interesting um, presentation or such an interesting hour, should I say, um, Catherine. Unfortunately, we've reached five o'clock, so we're going to have to call draw this to a close. You, 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 you were right to note Nabila's comment, interesting thoughts in the in the chat around um, the the speculum example and showing how patient care and consideration and bedside manner has 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 evolved by, by as manifested in the in the the evolution of the equipment itself um, and um, and how it she, Nabila notes how it would be interesting to see how it impacts the teaching of of the skill of doing a pap smear itself so there's so much to to engage in um, Catherine thank you so much um, I hope we've recorded this because I think what even if we haven't what I'd like to see is this just being a a, a trial run for uh, for a broader engagement. And Prof. Mguni mentioned in our in our meeting as the Adler team two days ago, it was that the 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 wish that we could have a roadshow, Catherine, and and um, perhaps it's it's this that that could be prefaced or this presentation or something of that sort. We could put a package together that didn't only involve you going to see a department and engaging, but rather some preparatory online engagement around the presentation first or something of that nature we should we should think 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 through it um i'm um i also want to just please note um nabila's comment um just to close off with because she notes just in my own thoughts now she says and then she gives an example of the speculum the speculum example and do we not need um so many more Nabila's um, of who she is and what competence she has and what she represents in in her and her and her skills and competence. The just the, the so much more to be seeded from just in my own thoughts now. In terms of of the way that we can innovate around training and research and particularly in this space to try to change things to try to shake shake things up a little bit. So Catherine, your 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 thank you so much. Um, and we, we're so grateful for your inputs this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for sticking around on this long day. We'll see you soon. And hopefully on the 7th, please come and have some yes. refreshments and give your critical input to that engagement between 2 and 4 on the 7th of September at the Adler. We'd be so happy to see you. Thank you, everyone.